All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night, in the dusty recesses of their minds, wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act their dream with open eyes to make it possible. This I did. There was simply no stopping the Uncharted franchise by the late 2000s, so it was no surprise when Sony announced another sequel at E3 2010. Game director Amy Hennig wanted a Desert Uncharted which would provide the opportunity to push the PlayStation 3's technical limits. Word has it that it was going to take nearly 50 gigabytes of data on one Blu-ray disc, and according to the PlayStation Store, it did. Which is insane for a PS3 game, GTA 5 was only a third of that size. Marketing costs nearly 5 million pounds in the UK alone, a day would go by and you would see something about Uncharted 3 at least once. There were contests, trailers on talk shows, and even a Japanese commercial starring Harrison Ford. Come to think of it, the hype towards this game was nearly at the magnitude of GTA 5 or Call of Duty, but now it's been a while since it was released. Has it held up like the rest of the series? Well, that's a stupid question because, yes, of course it has. But how? Two years after dealing with business in the Shambhala, Nathan Drake and Victor Sullivan go to a London pub to sell Sir Francis Drake's ring, which is actually a setup to track down Catherine Marlowe, who has a similar obsession with Francis Drake. With the help of Charlie Cutter and Chloe Fraser, they trace Marlowe's car to a secret underground library in which Drake finds a notebook that belonged to T.E. Lawrence, yep, Lawrence of Arabia Lawrence, which explained Francis Drake's expedition in Arabia commissioned by Queen Elizabeth I. Long hidden. What? Shush. Sh no shit, long hidden. Are you kidding me? No offense, mate, but your ancestor was a right asshole. Traces of the rivalry between Catherine Marlowe and Nathan Drake go back 20 years when he was a lonely teenager trying to take back his ancestor's ring at a museum in Colombia, which also explains how Drake and Sully got together. I see great things in our future, kid. Great things. In short, Nathan Drake and Victor Sullivan are on another treasure hunt traveling all over the world including UK, France, Syria and Yemen to continue unfinished Sir Francis Drake business. To be honest, I don't know why they didn't continue on immediately after their work on El Dorado, but considering what Zoran Lazarevich was up to in the second game, it was probably for the best. The flashback of teenager Nathan Drake is a better example of non-linear timeline change done right because the story stays unpredictable and there's more character development. It would have been good to see even more backstory but they obviously saved it for Uncharted 4. Because the villains use more skill than brute force and with a few twists and turns here and there, it makes the story so dark and mind-bending. This is proof that female antagonists can be just as badass as the male ones. These villains Malo and Talbot are pretty similar to the first game, only more developed, and it determines whether a story is good or bad. I would say this has the best in the series up to that point. Another new character is Charlie Cutter, who definitely fooled me into thinking he was just another thug working for Malo. Could have pulled a couple of those punches, Charlie. What do you mean? I hardly touched you. You headbutted me. All right, all right. I got a little swept up in the moment. Uh. Plus, he's voiced by Graham McTavish who also voiced Zoran Lazarevich. Mm-hmm. He looks like the kind of henchman you expect from a British gangster film. To put this kind of character in a treasure hunt sounds like a bit of a gamble, but I like him, so I think it paid off. Yeah, he's also claustrophobic. But aside from new villains and sidekick, everyone's back with Nathan Drake now being married to Elena Fisher. But that's sort of debatable. You're still wearing it. Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. It helps in this part of the world. Oh, really? Seriously? Don't flatter yourself. <laughs> I said in a review of the first game that the characters were undeveloped. But to go from that to questioning whether you can trust them, illustrating how relationships come to fruition, how Nathan Drake grew up, 
the series has come a really long way. It's probably one of the biggest strengths now because once you decide to replay the Uncharted series, lack of character development will no longer be an issue. Up here, it's chained shut. All right, back up. I'll shoot the lock off. Make sure that's the only thing you shoot off. I said lock. The first game was on one island. The second was on one continent, sort of. The third is set all over the planet, mostly in the Middle Eastern countries, but the scope continues to increase as the series goes on. It's like each Uncharted game has its own nickname. You have Jungle, Snow, and Desert. And because Naughty Dog developed this, you'll guarantee graphics that are fucking amazing. It reached its peak. This is a contender along with God of War 3, The Last of Us, and Gran Turismo 6 for the best looking exclusive on the PlayStation 3. Naughty Dog went all out from a technical and scope standpoint. They even fixed up Chloe's eyes. To be honest, all returning female characters look pretty different. Elena's hair looks closer to its original design. The camera angles, exotic locations, and close calls, once again, you're playing the game like an action-adventure film. You can tell the writers took as much inspiration from those types of films as they could. I mean, just explaining what countries Nathan and Drake goes to on its own is enough to say that this game is going to be an epic adventure. However, a little word of wisdom. Do not play this game if you legit suffer from arachnophobia, and I am serious about that. You okay? Yeah, I think so. Alright, let's not go back in there. So it has the best graphics and story of the PlayStation 3 trilogy, but if you know me, gameplay is the most important part. Did they approve this too? Well, no, actually. I would say they've taken a step back. You're dead! You hear me? You're dead! Not a big one. The gameplay is still very good, but enough to notice. Or maybe I'm just going too deep. Nathan Drake has the ability to shoot weapons, take cover, solve puzzles, and jump onto ledges regardless of the laws of physics, so it has all the right ingredients for an Uncharted game. So, what's wrong with it? Well, I know it sounds like a minor thing, but not being able to switch shoulder aim makes it harder to shoot enemies in cover. I was ready to go mental until I found out you can just go to the options and turn it on. Why it isn't standard this time, I'll never know. Drake's movement is probably even lighter than the first game. It's so sensitive I try to change the settings just to be comfortable, but it was no good. Like when you move the thumbstick just a little, it's all or nothing. You might as well control Drake's movement with the D-pad. The first two games I was able to solve every puzzle thrown at me, but here it reached a point where I had to use a walkthrough more than once, even with the given hints because it was that cryptic. Oh, don't be such a sissy. I admit, it's probably me and some of you can probably decipher these puzzles better than I can and that's fine. I'm just saying that the difficulty as it pertains to the puzzles has noticeably increased so be careful. The AI is too smart for their own good and surround you in numbers with every chance they've got. Did I forget to mention the box load of grenades thrown at your way, or the amount of bullets they can take? Oh boy. I swear, I had to take on a wave of at least two dozen enemies here. You have more ammo this time, so at least it has a little bit of mercy. To me, the second game was just more fun to play. Really, the only thing that's improved control-wise is when you're using your fists. Or maybe it's because there are a lot more of these moments and really grown used to them. But despite all that, at least it has a lot of the improvements that made Among Thieves stand out from Drake's fortune. Like combining the platforming and shooter genres together in a couple of situations. Gameplay time is slightly higher, and you can collect treasures, purchase different stuff, and there's online multiplayer. Overall, I feel like the game has taken just a tiny step back, but it still has a lot of the correct pieces for you to enjoy. After beating this game, I found there's no real final boss, but just a brawl between Drake and Talbot. Before that, Drake and Sully finally arrive at Uba. Drake goes mental again after drinking the water, even pointing a gun at Sully not knowing he's real, which kind of makes sense if Drake saw him get shot in the temple. What? 
Oh. Marlow and Talbot were going for a brass jar with hallucination drugs mixed with the water inside, but Drake and Sully ruined the whole party. This part when Sully goes into the water, I don't know why the henchman didn't shoot Drake when he dived in the water. Just think about that for a second. Now, why the fuck are those henchmen shooting at you at this point? The place is coming apart. I don't get it. I try to get out of there. Marlo gets stuck, drowns in the sand with Drake's ring. While Drake and Sully escape the kingdom sinking into the ground, Talbot wants revenge which boils down to a final brawl which is pretty similar to any fist fight meaning there's no real difficulty curve. It feels very climactic don't get me wrong, but not very challenging or satisfying. It pretty much made me think, well that was pretty easy, especially in comparison to the predecessors. It also made me realize that the overall premise of the whole game is too similar to Among Thieves. Drake is searching for something special, with two serious villains getting in the way. What they're searching for isn't what you think. They find a secret kingdom, and the finale results in that kingdom being destroyed. All of these things happen in both games. Is it just a coincidence? Or did the writers take it a little sad? Uh, stop. Just stop being a wise ass for one second. My final takeaway from Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception is that everything is better than the first two games, except for the gameplay which is pretty baffling. It just goes to show you how important it is, but all things considered, I still strongly recommend it for any PlayStation gamer as I give it an 8.5 out of 10. Nathan Drake delivered on the hype when this came out in 2011. I mean, it didn't really wow me like most professional gaming critics, but I still enjoyed it. I definitely got a satisfaction in beating it, even if you don't get a gold trophy for normal difficulty completion. You can find this along with the rest of the PlayStation 3 trilogy for a really good price, as well as the Nathan Drake collection on the PlayStation 4. You're missing out on an epic adventure if you haven't played them.